Hi there, you're watching World Panorama, your weekly roundup of all that has happened across the world. The big international news we'll be filling you in over the next half hour. But first, the international headlines this week. Russian President Vladimir Putin triggers fears of an arms race, announces that Russia will deploy 40 intercontinental ballistic missiles by next year. Pushed back by a joint offensive led by Nigeria, the Boko Haram hits back, triggers violence in Chad and Niger. As Greece grapples with bailout crisis, panicked citizens withdraw funds worth over 2 billion euros from banks, the European Union calls an emergency summit. And Olympian Mo Farah breaks silence over two missed tests before the London Olympics. Athlete says he has never taken performance-enhancing drugs. Controversy could snuff out Golden Glow of 2012. Well, our focus story this week on World Panorama is about Russia because facing damaging sanctions and increased military presence in NATO states in Eastern Europe, Russia tried to reassert itself by some time-tested saber-rattling this week. President, President Vladimir Putin announced uh, that he will put in more than 40 new intercontinental ballistic missiles into service this year, a measure that has unnerved NATO as well as experts in the region. The war of words between America and Russia is escalating. But what's even more worrying is that it's backed by military movement and army maneuvers. Earlier this week, President Vladimir Putin announced that Russia will add 40 new intercontinental ballistic missiles to its nuclear arsenal this year. Intercontinental ballistic missiles have a minimum range of over 5,500 kilometers. Putin gave no more details of which missiles were being added to the nuclear arsenal. In the coming year, the состав ядерных сил пополнит более 40 новых межконтинентальных баллистических ракет которые будут способны преодолевать любые, даже самые технически совершенные системы противоракетной обороны. Putin was reacting to a US plan to station tanks and heavy weapons in NATO states and Russia's border. Russia called it the most aggressive act by Washington since the Cold War. Нужно садиться за стол переговоров напрямую с представителями этих территорий и договариваться. Другого пути нет. Какие-то наши территории, то значит мы соответствующим образом должны будем нацелить наши вооруженные силы, ударные современные средства на те территории, из которых нам исходит угроза, а как же иначе. Also in the same week, Russia held air defense drills in the southern Rostov and Krasnodar regions close to the border with Ukraine. The exercises involve Sukhoi Su-25 SM fighter jets. Pilots perform various tasks from relocating from one airport to another, avoiding being spotted by enemy radars, to landing in pairs or with only one engine working. This uh, nuclear uh, saber rattling of uh, Russia is uh, unjustified, it's uh, uh, destabilizing and it's uh, dangerous. And, uh, uh, this is something which we are addressing and uh, it's also one of the reasons why we now are uh, increasing the readiness and the preparedness of our forces and uh, uh, we are uh, responding uh, by, the, uh, by making sure that the NATO also in the future is uh, uh, an alliance which uh, provides uh, deterrence and uh, protection uh, for all allies against any uh, threat. Tensions researched between Russia and Western powers over Moscow's role in the Ukraine crisis, in which pro-Russian separatist forces seized a large part of the country's east after Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine in early 2014. Given the scenario, experts are worried about what could happen accidentally when such powerful military forces are lined up so close to each other. There's always a chance that the Russian-backed separatists could broaden their conflict in eastern Ukraine. Not wholly inconceivable given the 2014 shooting down of a Malaysia Airlines commercial plane over Ukraine by rebels. 
More recently, a tragedy was averted when a Russian fighter jet came within 10 feet of a US Air Force aircraft over the Black Sea. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And we're joined by Manoj Joshi, Distinguished Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, to help us understand, is this just saber rattling by uh, the Russian president, or is there more to it? Is there a real cause for concern? Well, I think this is more of a reaction by the Russians. I wouldn't mm -hmm. call it saber rattling in the sense, uh, what happened in Ukraine is something which has affected Russia profoundly. Ukraine and Russia, there's a historical link between them. But Russia feels that NATO is encroaching in its sphere of influence, and is reacting. Alongside that, for the past two or three years, the Russians have also been undertaking a massive military build-up. Mm. In the sense, back in the uh, 2000s and the late, uh, uh, later part of the 20th, last decade of the 20th century, uh, Russian military power had been declining steadily. And it's only in the last couple of years that President Putin has decided to put in 200 to 300 billion dollars mm. uh, in a military build-up. And uh, so that military build-up has many components. Uh, part of it is to modernize the armor, modernize the air force, uh, also modernize the strategic arsenal. And I think the news reference to 40 uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, is relates to that. Mm. Because they are looking at newer missiles which are capable of evading uh, US uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile systems. Right. And the ICBMs really relate to the United States, not to the Europe, because mm. they are, after all, ICBMs, yeah. meaning you know, they are long-range uh, missiles. So at one level, uh, what Putin is trying to signal is uh, the deterrence capacity of Russia's military forces, that you don't interfere or don't push us mm. too far. Mm. And as part of that, you are seeing more uh, assertive or a return to the um, uh, assertiveness by the Russians. Mm. You see Russian aircraft patrol going uh, deep into uh, towards the uh, European uh, uh, side. Right. Russia warning a number of European countries mm. uh, not to uh, sort of get involved in any kind of um, uh, alliance against them. So uh, I think basically Russia is reacting. The, the, the sanctions that are imposed by yeah. the West are deeply affecting Russia. I mean, does this mean more sanctions? Because already a significant amount of sanctions are being imposed uh, given what has been happening in Ukraine. Do you see further deterioration of ties, especially between the Western world and Russia? Well, it is possible in the sense that uh, uh, there's always room for, for, for uh, error there. And I think that the West is, uh, in that sense, uh, not doing the right thing. I think they are pushing the Russians a bit, uh, a tad too far. And uh, I don't know... Uh, because, you know, there are some very negative consequences, especially for a country like India. Mm. Because what's happening is that the more the West is pushing uh, uh, Russia, Russia is leaning towards China. Mm. And Russia, which used to be an important, has a very important role uh, in Indian security. You know, if it goes closer to China, uh, it has implications for us. Mm. So, uh, very direct implications, uh, implications absolutely, indeed. Absolutely. And that, that's the part that worries me. Of course... Uh, the United States, you know, and, and uh, West European countries put it in terms of democracy, etc. But I don't think it's as simple as that. Mm. It is a more complex issue. Uh, it is some, it, there is an issue of spheres of influence. Mm. They, uh, Russia does uh, feel threatened by the, the expansion of, of uh, NATO. Uh, there are questions that can be asked about it as to why it should be taking place in, in the first place. Mm. All right, but that's what uh, the Russian Deputy Defense Minister Anatoly Anatov, uh, Antonov has also said, that Russia is being forced into an arms race. Would you agree with that? That, uh, I mean, given the fact that the US and its allies in the West, in Western Europe are sort of uh, coming together, uh, in that sense, is Russia feeling that kind of a Cold War kind of thing emerging it is, again? It's definitely feeling the pressure. Mm. And, of course, what it's also trying to do is that, as I told you, that it's uh, uh, had a huge... Uh, military industrial complex, right. which got run down. Mm. So basically, it is also trying to revive some of that mm. because it realizes that, you know, it, uh, for a long time, there was no investment in many of those areas. Mm. And so it needs to invest and they have got, uh, the, 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 the Russians are hugely talented in a number of areas uh, in terms of fighter aircraft or tanks or, or missiles, uh, etc. But, you know, they need investment in those areas. But of course, the basic issue that the Russians have to confront is the strategic issue. Mm. And the strategic, uh, the strategic uh, what should I say, uh, 
larger picture mm. uh, is not very uh, healthy for them, mm. primarily because of their economy, which is over dependent on, on natural resources, mm. oil and other natural resources, and also the problem of its demographics. Mm. Russia has a declining population. Right. And that, again, you cannot have a, a, you cannot restore your economy, recover your economy, uh, and you have a declining population, uh, and you have this vast country. Mm. Uh, so Russia, the pressure that Russia feels is a more complex one. It's mm. not just that, uh, the, the, uh, that the NATO is expanding um, by itself, mm. but it is a more complex pressure, which part of it is internal, part of it when they're looking at themselves, mm. uh, they're seeing, you know, there was this past glory of the Soviet Union, uh, which has, uh, you know, evaporated. Right. Uh, then they are seeing that they are they, that they, 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 the the NATO is expanding and uh, slowly encroaching in what they consider is their vital hmm. strategic sphere. Do you think this uh, would uh, increase further? I mean, very quickly because that's my last question. Do you think this kind of uh, standoff uh, could see could become worse? You see, uh, recently Mr. Kerry went to. Uh, Russia and they were try, there were efforts to try to reset this mm. uh, whole issue. Uh, I think the West needs to make a gesture here, and the West needs to rethink its uh, its its policy uh, with regard to Russia. Mm. Uh, if 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 they think that they can push Russia over the brink, I think that's not a very healthy uh, attitude. Mm. On the other hand, if they can manage this this uh, thing in a more uh, in a less confrontational manner, because as far as I can see. What I see is uh, Russia reacting to a situation right. uh, that, it, uh, that, that was created hmm. um, when this whole Ukraine uh, developments began. All right, Manoj Joshi, we'll leave it over there. But thank you very much for coming in and helping us uh, understand the standoff between uh, Russia and uh, the Western powers, uh, if I may call them. So thanks so much for that. Well, uh, moving on now onto news from Africa, where militants from the Islamic group Boko Haram crossed the Nigerian border and attacked two towns in neighboring Niger. They killed at least 40 people on Thursday. It was the second attack in a week by the group that had already engineered two suicide bombings in Chad. Both attacks have revealed the Boko Haram's determination to strike inside countries that joined the Nigerian military's attempt to smash it. A resurgent Boko Haram is winning the battle of terror, at least for now. After suffering many reverses till late last month, the Islamist group asserted itself with twin bomb blasts in Chad. At least 27 people were killed and over 100 injured in the capital. <laughs> The attacks included at least one suicide bomb, the first of their kind in Chad. The oil producing nation is a major Western ally that has been in the forefront of offensives on Al-Qaeda-linked groups in Mali and on Boko Haram in Nigeria. In retaliation, Chad on Wednesday banned burqas, calling them a form of camouflage. The government ordered security forces to seize them from markets. The Prime Minister said they couldn't be worn, not only in public places and schools, but anywhere in the country. Security is an issue that affects every, that, uh, every nation takes very seriously and the rise of extremism and terrorism across our region and indeed the world has made the issue even more pertinent. Our meetings, not only as members of LCBC, but at the bilateral or multilateral levels, have created opportunity for us to move a step further in the ongoing fight against terrorism and criminal elements within our region. Neighboring Nigeria also stepped up the fight. New President Mohamedou Buhari has already mooted a regional military force against Boko Haram. On 11th June, he told a summit of leaders from Chad, Niger and Benin that he was pledging $100 million to set up the force. In a six-year insurgency, Boko Haram killed thousands and displaced 1.5 million people. The group says it wants to establish an Islamic state in Nigeria's impoverished northeast. 
Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. Time for us to take a very quick break, but on the other side, we'll talk about two more Republican ent entrants that have enlivened in proceedings in the U.S. presidential race. That and more after a very short break. Welcome back. You're watching World Panorama. Now on to news from Greece, where the country is facing a full-blown banking crisis after Eurozone finance ministers failed to agree on steps to prevent the country from sliding into a debt crisis. The European Central Bank's Governing Council held an emergency session for an increase in emergency liquidity to Greek banks. In Greece, the protests are giving way to panic. Many people are withdrawing savings. Nearly 2 billion euros were taken out of Greek banks this week. The withdrawal started after European officials and the International Monetary Fund on Thursday failed to strike a deal on Greece's bailout program. The nation is dangerously close to a default and a possible exit from the eurozone. No one is buying assurances from the Greek central bank chief that the banking system was stable. <laughs> Πολύ πιθανό να γίνει αυτό, όλοι το αποφεύγουμε. Βέβαια, αν γίνει αυτό, το επόμενο βήμα είναι το χάος και η καταστροφή. After the talks collapsed within an hour of discussions, the European Union called an emergency summit of leaders for Monday in a final push to prevent Greece from going bankrupt. European leaders say the onus is on Greece to enforce tough reforms. What we need is credible measures which fill in the fiscal gaps which are still in the, in the, in the talks and credible measures to bring the economy back on track. Uh, and the big question is whether the Greek government is prepared to take them because they are inevitable, they are necessary for Greece. Uh, and if they're not prepared to do that, then they are taking a big, big risk uh, on the future of Greece. Dialogue, 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 dialogue discussion, discussion, confrontation, if le faut, the mais avancer dans ce dialogue. Et c'est possible. Les différences ne sont pas aussi grandes qu'on voudrait le dire. Greece needs to urgently strike a deal or face default on a 1.6 billion euro loan repayment to the International Monetary Fund. It risks having to leave the Eurozone and possibly also the EU. But the European Commission, the IMF and the ECB are unwilling to unlock bailout funds until Greece agrees to reforms. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Now on to news of the US presidential elections where with a whole lot of provocative comments, a real estate mogul and TV personality Donald Trump has joined the presidential race. And in fact, he'll be competing against Jeb Bush in the 2016 presidential sweepstakes. The crowded US presidential campaign pool now nearly has 12 candidates with more expected to throw their hats in the ring. The presidency should not be passed on from one liberal to the next. I am officially running for President of the United States. The battle lines are drawn for the US presidency. Earlier this week, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush and then TV personality Donald Trump threw their hats in the ring. Joining nine others in announcing their candidacy for the Republican nomination in the 2016 elections. The presidency should not be passed on from one liberal to the next. So here's what it comes down to. Our country's on a very bad course. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? The question for me, the question for me is, what am I going to do about it? And I've decided I'm a candidate for President of the United States of America. You know, all of my life I've heard that a truly successful person, a really, really successful person, and even modestly successful, cannot run for public office. Just can't happen. And yet that's the kind of mindset that you need to make this country great again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States. Bush vowed to fix a dysfunctional Washington, even as he's trying to move away from the shadow of the White House legacies left by his father and brother. The 62-year-old is seeking to be seen as his own man, 
while presenting himself as an anti-Washington figure with a can-do spirit. He was joined by his mother Barbara Bush at the event. Former Presidents George H. W. Bush, his father, and George W. Bush, his brother, did not attend. I will campaign as I would serve, going everywhere, speaking to everyone, keeping my word, facing the issues without flinching, and staying true to what I believe. I will take nothing and no one for granted. I will run with heart and I will run to win. Trump, on the other hand, was widely seen as having little chance of winning the nomination. Expected to enliven the proceedings with his outspokenness, the billionaire lost no time in launching into his role. Immediately needling the Mexican government by labeling migrants as drug runners and rapists and pledging to build a great wall along the Mexico-American border. And these are the best and the finest. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. 69-year-old Trump owns several hotels and hosts the reality show The Celebrity Apprentice on NBC. President Barack Obama promised to tighten security on the Mexico border while offering millions of illegal immigrants who learn English find a chance to become citizens but has so far failed to deliver. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Time now for us to take a look at some other uh, events that made headlines around the globe this week. Twenty-one-year-old Dylan Roof was arrested on nine counts of murder after he admitted to shooting dead nine people at the Charleston Church. Roof said he was trying to start a race war. U.S. President Barack Obama said the incident is a wake-up call to America. Kurdish fighters took full control of the border town of Tal Abyad, dealing a major blow to the Islamic State group's ability to wage war in Syria. Kurdish units, known as the YPG, along with their allies from the Free Syrian Army, are cleaning up the town along the border with Turkey from booby traps. Islamist President Mohammad Morsi has appealed a life sentence handed to on charges of spying for Palestinian Islamist group Hamas. The same court also upheld his death sentence. Morsi is charged with facilitating the escape of prisoners during the 2011 uprising that ousted veteran strongman Hosni Mubarak. Hong Kong's lawmakers rejected a bill proposed by the Chinese government to vote Beijing-approved candidates as their next leader. In a vote on Thursday, 28 out of Hong Kong's 70 lawmakers rejected the proposal. Eight voted in favour. It's time to bring you up to speed with all the sports news that happened around the world. Radamel Falcao has hinted that his future will be settled shortly with a season-long loan move from Monaco to Chelsea, set to be completed before the end of the Copa America. Falcao, who's 29 years old, scored just four goals in 26 Premier League appearances during a loan spell at Manchester United last season and was the subject of widespread criticism for his performances in England. However, the Colombian striker has said that he wants to continue his career in the Premier League and revealed that his future may lie at Stamford Bridge for the 2015-16 season. Sabine Lizicki set a new world record in her women's singles clash against Belinda Benchik as she blasted 27 aces in their second round encounter at the Queen's Club tournament. The former Wimbledon finalist fired 16 aces in the first set while the other 11 were served in the second set. Liziki has now crossed the world record of 24 aces which was jointly held by American Serena Williams and Estonia's Kaya Kanepi. British Olympic winner Mo Farah is reportedly supposed to have missed two drug tests before he went on to become a double gold medalist at the 2012 London Olympics. According to reports, Farah missed the first doping test in early 2010 
months before he joined Alberto Salazar's Nike Oregon project and the second one came at his home in February 2011 when he claimed not to have heard the doorbell. Faraz's gold medals in the 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters at London 2012 were among the top moments of the Games. Well, that's a wrap on World Panorama this week and we'll be back with another edition next week. But as we go, we'll leave you with this. Some 1 billion Muslims in more than 50 countries around the world started observing the month-long fast for the Islamic month of Ramzan on Friday. The first day of the holy month, devotees filled markets to buy iftar to break their fast. I'm going to leave you with these visuals from Dhaka.